So this is a uh, democratizing plant variety trialing through community science. Um, my name is Jay Bost and I'm the moderator of today's session. Uh, until really recently, I spent the last uh, eight years out on the island of Oahu and Hawaii working with uh, Go Farm Hawaii, a new farmer training program of the University of Hawaii, and also with the Hawaii Seed Growers Network. And in the context of um, that, we did a decent amount of variety trialing. And that was typically in the context of either a production or um, educational arms. And um, just through the experiences of doing that, I got really uh, curious about how other folks kind of juggle trying to do trying to do trials in the context of educational farms or production farms, that's not someone's full-time job to be running, um, running, thinking a lot about how you juggle, um, trying to collect data and manage these trials while doing other things. And so during that time, I came across um, the work of all the folks that I am happy to have gathered um, here to we're going to hear from um, from their experiences. So probably most of you here are um, already on board and excited about community science. But in the context of doing trials, um, it's an exciting um, thing to consider. It's a great way to educate and inspire. Um, youth. It was a great way for us to engage with new farmers and get them excited about trialing right from the get-go. It's a great way to work with existing growers and then it's a great way to get the general public excited about um, different crops, different varieties. Um, and then from the point of view of the, of the people organizing the trial, um, it's a way to get more locations and more feedback um, in theory by doing less work. But I think that as we'll hear from our, you know, folks today, that's one thing I was really that we could get to discussing in this is it's you have maybe less field work. You personally are growing fewer um, replications or less field space, but then you have all of this other um, stuff. And then the other great thing is you're really broadening the perspectives that you're getting on your trials and many more eyes on it, um, just not just your own or um, other researchers. Um, so today we're kind of hoping to hear from our panelists um, about different ways that they've learned about how to organize and how not to organize your um, trial engaging folks how to manage the data, how to keep uh, participants involved, and then how to share um, the results. Um, I just thought I would share before we start off with, um, with the panelists, just a couple of resources. Um, I think it's because I've been teaching, I can't help share things like this sometimes. Just a few folks I've been really inspired by. Um, Lane can correct me if I say his name wrong, Salvatore Ceccarelli. Um, it was a breeder for a long time, and I believe still is in Italy and um, in Syria and elsewhere. It's a great review paper. Um, so if that's your kind of thing, um, this is a paper, and we can um, put this into the chat box um, if anybody wants to follow that up. And then someone else's work who I've been really inspired by, and I think that um, Nico will be able to tell us a bit more about Jacob Van Etten, who has collaborated some with Seedlink, um, has been doing this neat work, and it really caught my eye, this idea of crowdsourcing participatory variety. And they've developed some um, methodologies and software and statistical analysis. And so down here in the left-hand corner, this climb mob um, them out and then here are a few um, papers if, if papers are your kind of um, thing and then I just couldn't help plugging because I love this. this is one of my favorite things in the world agricultural biodiversity weblog 
a great general resource and you can go right here into this search bar. I did this this morning and put in participatory and I had like 20 pages of results come up, but a really neat, neat resource for all sorts of things um, related to all the sorts of things that um, we are all interested in. Um, I just wanted to point that we have some related sessions coming up. So for those of you excited about um, community science and participatory work. Um, on Wednesday, the Heirloom Collards Project, which Chris Smith, who is a big part of that, um, will be um, with us today. And also Seed Sarah Exchange, where Stefan is from, was involved with that, and Lane Selman. Um, and then we've got some more um, participatory based presentations coming up. And then I believe one of these on Thursdays, the participatory participatory growers works. Um, that is from kind of more university-based folks um, and versus a lot of the folks today, I would really say are more grassroots. No one's necessarily university um, affiliated directly. So it'll be like a little bit of a different perspective. So, our agenda for today is first, um, Lane is going to speak with us. And I think each of our speakers will be about uh, 10 minutes just to let them know a bit about um, their work. So Lane's gonna talk to us and then um, from Seeds Exchange has made a video for us that we'll watch. And then Chris Smith from the Utopian Seed Project has a video for us. Then Nico from Seedlink has a video for us and then Tyler, Glenn, and Marielle from uh, Seeds of Honua out in Hawaii have a video for us. And then after we've finished those videos, Kristen Leach um, will join us live and give us an update on her work. And then that should leave us with, um, you know, half an hour or 45 minutes for discussion um, amongst the panelists and with you, the audience, and questions and um, answers. So as we're going along, feel free to put any questions that you have, um, either jot them down and save them for the end or go ahead and put them um, in the chat and um, we'll get to those at the end. So the first um, person I want to introduce is Lane Selman. And many of you may know Lane, who worked with the Culinary Breeding Network. I think she's collaborated with almost everyone that is on the um, call. And she has just done really great through the Culinary Breeding Network, uh, bringing all sorts of stakeholders together and making variety a very um, interesting and fun and accessible um, experience for folks. So we're gonna hear from Lane and then um, we'll jump into the video. So welcome Lane and thanks everybody for being here. I'm gonna Thank you, try Jay. To... Thanks. Yep. You can see my screen? Yeah. Okay, hold on, let me find this. Okay, thanks for having me here. Sorry, I have to move that. Um, okay, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to hear everyone's presentation and I am gonna try to get through this in 10 minutes. Okay. So um, as Jay said, um, I run this initiative called the Culinary Breeding Network. Um, and I was gonna talk today a little bit about how I have been engaging the public uh, in var variety selection and development. And a lot of people here have seen some of this and been involved in this. Um, so I, if I go fast, I apologize. Um, you can ask me questions for clarification at the end. Um, so the, Culinary Breeding Network, as many of you know, is the mission really is to build communities. So building communities of and bringing together plant breeders, seed growers, farmers, produce buyers, chefs, and basically everyone that eats <laughs> to improve quality in vegetables and grains. Um, and as you can see from these images, I chose these images because these are a lot of different activities um, that I've organized and been a part of. And as you can see, they all involve people quite a bit. So I'm going to talk a little bit about pre-COVID and post-COVID. Uh, so you can see some of these ways that we've been trying to, um, how we have in the past been very successful in engaging uh, the public and involving folks in um, variety selection and um, 
and, and uh, development and then what we're trying to do now when we are in a situation where we oftentimes cannot physically get together. Okay, so what many of you have been involved with and attended and what is Culinary Green Network is the most well known for is this now a very large event called the Variety Showcase of which there have been five events that have been organized in Portland, Oregon, two that I've organized with Jay Bost in Oahu and then two in New York City. Um, there are two, uh, well, actually three coming up that I'll tell you about. One will be virtual with Organic Seed Alliance uh, that will focus on California seed work. And that is going to be June 6th, 7th, and 8th, which will be virtual. So I hope that you'll join us and you'll see um, more promotion about that on social media coming up pretty soon. Um, and then there um, will be one in some format, either in person or virtual in Madison, Wisconsin, probably in um, August or September, and then the following year in 2013 in New York somewhere. Um, so we do have plans for more of these in the future. So the Variety Showcase is a place where um, plant breeders and folks that are doing seed work can show off the work that they are doing and get input from the public. The last one that we had, if you can see here in the bottom left, was totally packed. There were 700 individuals that came. There are 40 tables. There are 130 different breeders, researchers, chefs, et cetera, that were actually involved at the tables. In the bottom right-hand corner, you can see a table that had been set up a few years ago by Organic Seed Alliance. And so these are carrot um, breeding lines that they are able to bring in, this is part of their um, carrot for organic um, improve, I'm sorry, organic improvement in agriculture, I believe, CIOA project where they can get a lot of input from farmers and consumers about what they want out of carrots. So this has been a hugely successful event where it's not collecting data and crunching it and all of that, but it is a place where uh, plant breeders get a significant amount of input from uh, the public on what they're working on. Okay, so a couple of things that we've done in the field because it's so, super awesome to take people out in the field. Uh, on the left hand side, you can see that farmers are selecting here favorite plants that are in a breeding uh, population. This was part of a Novik uh, field day and Nor Novik is the Northern Organic Vegetable Improvement Collaborative. Um, we had folks, we would give them flags and have them go through populations and flag their favorite uh, plants for whatever reason um, in the field. Um, so that's been something we've done in the field that's been fantastic, um, as well as on the right-hand side, this is Chef Tim Wastel, who I work with quite a bit out at Adaptive Seed, uh, where we are doing selections within a breeding population of kale to create a new variety. So this was more, a little bit more one-on-one -on -one with a chef and a breeder. Um, and then the left-hand side was a, a big community event that was open to the public. Uh, some of you have seen this also. This is a flavor wheel. This has been really very popular for farmers that were uh, asking to um, have like a lexicon created. They actually wanted a lexicon created for tomatoes to begin with, but we had funding for winter squash. So this is what we did. <laughs> so we convened um, culinary professionals, but particularly I reached out to coffee roasters and winemakers and that are very, quite good at identifying and being able to describe flavor. So there's the process that we went through with this. I can send people information about that afterward if they're interested to create this wheel in the end. Um, just another type of way that we have been engaging um, folks to be able to collaboratively um, you know, accomplish this work. Okay, so now talking about, um, that, that was all, that was all like very easy, really, kind of to get all these people excited. People are always very excited to get together and taste things. So if you ask, you know, people are like, how do you get so many chefs involved? And it's like, well, I don't know. You just you just call them and ask them and they all want to be involved in it, right? So they want to get together. They want to talk about vegetables and grains. Um, and so I don't think that that part is hard at all. Um, but it has been a little more challenging to do this during COVID. Um, and specifically when we have trials, like this is a Shishido trial that we had as part of Novik. And, um, on the left-hand side is Adriana, and she's one of the farmers that were growing the Shishido trials. Um, she did a call out on Instagram, um, and she, she posted some of her um, Shishidos, and she told her customers that she was doing this um, trial. We asked chefs as well as consumers to participate in this, as you can see in the top 
um, photo here. We've got Jim Myers and Haley, his graduate student that are harvesting all the shishitos. Um, and the way that we managed to do this was we work with Nico who through Seedlink um, created the, you know, the tasting so that it could be all online, uh, you know, all on your, your phone, um, put together the QR codes. Um, there's two here because we had a shishito tasting and then we had a baccatum um, species pepper trial as well. Um, so folks that were interested, and you can see there's a lot of bags here. Folks that were interested, um, let us know. Um, you, you know. All this was done through Instagram and then I have like a list of chefs that I work with and we give them directions on how to prepare it and then they could just do it on their phone. Okay, so far as far as what you don't want to do, you don't want to say we're going to deliver these to your house, okay? Because that's what we did, and I spent like days driving around Portland delivering them. So you could say if you want to do this, you can come to my house and pick up the bag on my front porch. So there's a learning lesson right there. But this was really fantastic. Uh, I did this with some friends. We were in a pod together this was the beginning of like total lockdown. So I brought all these people together. We prepared the shishitos the way that I had explained, um, the way that people normally eat them. And we did this and see, so you say everybody's holding up their phone and it was quite easy. Uh, so it was fantastic. Seedlink made that very easy. Okay, another thing that we did was, uh, this is Patrick Mercer and he has been working with me for the past year. He finished a master's degree with Julie Dawson. And so we needed to have our winter squash tasted for again, part of Novik. Um, and he used Julie Dawson's method, which uh, might be published somewhere. I'm sorry. I'm not sure what that is. I can try to find that if it is, but it's, um, and I know that Organic Seed Alliance has used this as well, where they use these um, disposable or reusable uh, aluminum muffin pans, um, and you cook them in a certain way. We give them all the, you know, the directions, and folks do the tasting that way. And I think with this one, he used Qualtrics. Sometimes he uses Qualtrics and sometimes Seed Linked. On the left-hand side, you can see here, uh, this is a chef that was in town, and he and his son uh, did the tasting at home. They, you know, we we do encourage people to like get excited about it, post about it on Instagram, get people, you know, really interested and in wanting to to think about the differences in flavor and texture and everything. So it's been really fun. People really liked it. We also went to the next level here, and we did a pot, like a, a radio show. This is a community radio station, KBU here, and Patrick and I were on it, talking about the results and talking about how we had this tasting. Um, so that was really cool. Got more people on our mailing list. So more people will be engaged, hopefully, in the future. Uh, the last one I was going to talk to you a little bit about was um, I'm working also with the Dry Farm Collaborative, uh, an, an institute here in Oregon. Um, so it's like, okay, what are we going to do? How are we going to get people to know about uh, different types of tomatoes that are being grown in this dry farm manner and find out what's the difference in flavor as far as dry farm, irrigated, grafted, not grafted, all these different things that we had in our trials. Uh, so we had an outdoor dry farm tomato festival. Um, we put together the bags and have pictures of them. I think they're behind Patrick here. And it was crazy. We gave out like 170 of these bags. Again, we did it through um, C LinkedIn Qualtrics. It was very easy for people. Uh, we did this. And then we also partnered with a, um, a farmer that was growing the trial to, and we went to her, her farm when there was a CSA pickup and we put the bags together for that. And so when people picked up their CSA, they also picked up a bag and they could go home and taste them uh, and gave it. And we got, a lot, we got a lot of data this way, guys. We got a lot of data this way, much more so than we did, um, you know, just if we're, if we're coming together in person. If you want information on that Tri Farm tomato results, that, there it is right there in the tiny URL. And here's my contact information. If you want to find out anything, the most up-to-date always, of course, is Instagram. And that's all I have right there. 10 minutes. Thanks. Thanks, Jane. So we've um, we've got some of the some links of some of the different projects that are getting mentioned coming up in the chat as we go along. And I believe we're going to now um, get into some of our pre-recorded um, videos, if I'm not mistaken, that are getting queued up as we speak. All right. I'm ready with Stefan's video. All right. Anything you want to share, Jay, before I click play? 
I'm hoping Stefan's going to tell us everything we need to know uh, right. um, about the great work that he's been doing. Looking forward to it. Okay, here we go. Put messages in the chat if anything's going awry on the video, but we're going to play Stefan's recording now. My name is Stefan Mursky, and I'm the Evaluation and Trials Manager at Seed Savers Exchange. And I also coordinate the Community Science ADAPT program, which is what I'll be talking about in this presentation. So what is the ADAPT program? ADAPT is a community science program in which gardeners and farmers trial varieties from the Seed Savers Exchange collection and send us feedback on their performance. Seed Savers started the ADAPT program in 2011 as a way for the public to help us evaluate varieties in the collection. Starting in 2019, the main purpose of ADAPT became engaging the public to trial varieties that we were considering introducing into our catalog. There are three main goals of ADAPT, one being um, to engage the public in the work that we do. Another is to crowdsource data on the performance of varieties across different regions and environments. And the third being to identify outstanding varieties from the collection in order to introduce them to our catalog. So how it works is that we typically offer between five and 10 trials per year. Trials are determined through an interdepartmental collaborative process within Seed Savers to decide what types of crops and varieties we'd like to offer in future catalogs. Each trial consists of about six to 10 varieties. Usually all the varieties come from the collection, except one which comes from our catalog and serves as the control variety. The varieties that we choose typically have performed well here at Heritage Farm and usually have well-documented stewardship histories. Participants get to choose which trials they want to do and then are randomly assigned three varieties from the trial. We send out seeds in early March. Participants grow the varieties and collect data on key performance traits like flavor and productivity, which are customized for each trial. Participants then submit feedback through the seed linked platform. Nico Engelbear, who is also in this panel, will talk about seed linked in more depth in his video. But just briefly, SeedLinked is a web platform that we use to manage our ADAPT trials. And that includes tracking participation, collecting feedback, and publishing results. In order to take part in the trials, you have to create an account on SeedLinked. <clears throat> on your account, you can see profiles of the varieties you're growing, submit your data, upload photos, and view the full results of the trial. There are lots of other cool features on SeedLinked, um, like a community feed that makes it easy to connect with other people in the trials. SeedLinked also has a free app, so you can do all those things directly in the field. This slide shows all the trials that we offered in the ADAPT program last year. There were eight in total, including slicing tomato, okra, paste tomato, spinach, winter squash, kale, lettuce, and pole snap bean. One of the great things about joining the ADAPT program that we hear from people is getting to grow interesting heirlooms that aren't commercially available yet. I just wanna highlight a couple examples from over the years. Oma's orange tomato seeds came to us from Betty Moore of Ohio, who is pictured in her kitchen on the left. She has stewarded, stewarded this variety since 1983 when she got it from her mother, who she called Oma. Oma was given seeds of the tomato in the 1930s by a relative in West Virginia. Betty remembers her mom starting tomato transplants in old dish pans on her glassed in back porch. Oma used these tomatoes to make a tomato cocktail that she made from five different vegetables simmered together and then canned. The picture shows Betty after canning her first batch of tomato cocktail. 
Here's another variety with an interesting history that we included in the 2020 melon trial. Montreal Market Melon, which is nicknamed the Caviar of Cantaloupe, is a green fleshed melon that was widely grown around Montreal, which used to be considered the fruit basket of Quebec. Orchard use, orchards used to thrive there, and several horse tracks in the area provided lots of manure for fertilizer. In 1881, Burpees commercialized the melon in the United States. And into the early 1900s, Canadian farmers shipped them by train to New York and the Northeastern US, packed in hay to avoid bruising the flesh. The melon almost became extinct because it was replaced by more reliable disease resistant varieties and varieties that were more suitable for shipping. The melon was rediscovered in the USDA collection in 1997 and is now offered by a few Canadian seed companies. We got seed from one of those companies, Annapolis Seeds, and, we'd off and we offered it in our catalog for the first time last year. <laughs> this graph shows participation in all of our ADAPT trials last year. Batavia lettuce was our most popular with 141 participants followed by snap bean and semi-savoy semi spinach, um, all the way down to okra with 74 people. With the higher participation that we've seen in, in recent years, it's become somewhat challenging to find varieties from the collection with sufficient inventory um, because we work with small quantities of seeds in our collection. <clears throat> This map shows the participation of um, uh, in last year's trials, and you can see that they're scattered all over the country um, with someone in Hawaii and even a handful of people in Canada. The wide distribution of participants presents some challenges in terms of the timing for sending out seeds and setting deadlines for feedback that works for everybody. Uh, we have growers in the deep south, with a much longer grower season, obviously, than growers in the, in the north. One thing that a lot of participants in the ADAPT program want is a way to connect with each other. We created a Facebook group last year, um, which was very popular. And then towards the end of the year, Seedlink rolled out its own community feed feature. Um, we found that having multiple platforms for networking ensures that more people can connect with each other since um, different people prefer different ways of communicating. I want to go back and show you the results of the 2019 tomato trials, which included Oma's Orange that I talked about earlier. As you can see, um, it performed the best out of the eight varieties overall, and so the committee voted to introduce it into the catalog. So that set a process in motion, and here you can see the variety is in production for seed. This is a picture of Cody um, on our field operations team processing the seeds. And here's the variety a couple years later in our catalog for the first time in 2021. So while the program has some challenges, the benefits are many. We have a growing community of gardeners who are excited and, ex and inspired by the opportunity to grow heirloom varieties and provide input on what gets introduced into our catalog. The program also provides a means of assuring that our catalog will continue to provide high quality varieties that will sell and grow well and ensures that there's already some familiarity with the varieties when they become available. Crowdsourcing also allows us to trial many more varieties from the collection and gather more data with far fewer resources than it would take um, to do that all here on site. So that's the ADAPT program in a nutshell. Thank you very much for listening. Awesome, thanks Stefan. Hope that's um, not too awkward to watch a video of yourself on Zoom in front of a bunch of people.
Um, I think that we'll we'll hold off on questions unless anybody's got something super burning um, for Stefan right now. Um, and I believe that Rebecca will be queuing up our next video. Is that true? Yes, just one moment. Awesome. I mean, one question I could ask real quick is how, how do you generate that cool map um, that shows where the participants are? Is that easy to do? Is that like a default in something else you're using? Hi, my name is Chris Smith. I'm the executive. All right. <laughs> um, yeah, Jay, no, that, that was fairly simple. It was just through Google Maps. Um, so we just imported all the addresses and, um, and yeah. It, it was okay. Yeah. All right, Rebecca, are we ready? All right, we're queuing up Chris Smith who got booted off, but said he's back on now live with us to watch himself in a video. <laughs> Always a fun experience. Thanks. Um, just working through the different file types. So let me just double check. We have the sound coming through. And do we now have a big gray box in front of the video screen? Looks good to me. Looks good. Okay. Just wanted to check. Okay. Here we go. Take it away, Chris. Hi. My name is Chris Smith. I'm the executive director of a small nonprofit in Western North Carolina called the Utopian Sea Project. We do a whole bunch of different crop trials. Today, I'm going to speak to you about a community seed selection project that we took on in 2021. It's actually the first time we've done something like this. We're a fairly young nonprofit. Uh, but basically, we were trying to select uh, okra variety back towards pale genetics. So this pod in the top left is a good pale pod, and the same population of seeds has all these darker green colors, and we were trying to get it back to all pale. It's actually a project that came out of a restoration project that I was working on with Seed Savers Exchange. They, they sent me the seeds for Whidbey White and told me that there were some mixed up green genetics and we were trying to select it back to this pale pod. So it's been this multi-year selection process to get back to something that's truly pale. And I was doing fairly small populations in 2018 and 2019. And in 2020, I had the opportunity to do a much longer, you know, 250 foot row of this okra. And I was able to make some very harsh selections on the population. And I felt pretty good about where it was going. But the seeds I had from that year, you know, I had I had about 10 pounds of seeds even after the harsh selection. And I was never going to be able to grow all those out myself. And obviously, when you're making selections year on year, then the previous year's seeds become somewhat redundant. So I had all these seeds and I was like, well, I could I could make this project be much broader than myself and have a whole bunch of other people grow them out, basically, and uh, make selections with me. And that was kind of like the somewhat organic birth of this community seed selection project was just okay i'm hearing some reports that it may be frozen how's it looking for you all just wanna check in to engage with a lot more people. before we keep going what does it look like on your end jay still still frozen the actual video but hearing the audio um okay should we try another and troubleshoot on that while we're watching um yeah we could do that maybe? can cut to someone else for a moment sorry about that chris thanks everyone for letting me know i definitely do not want to keep going on something that isn't working for you um so who shall we move on to jay how about nico Let's move on to Nico. Okay. 
So if you're on a phone, you may want to turn your, your screen the other direction. Nico is sharing in a phone format. So again, give me the um, thumbs up when you see it. No, but it's like you can me rappeler. Hi everyone, here's Nico Angelbert at Seedlink. Thanks so much for joining the session and listening. Uh, I'm so excited to talk a little bit about our progress and work and how do we really help to democratize variety trial um, for all community of all size. And really democratizing variety trialing is really democratizing data-driven decision around seed um, for all. And really that's a core mission uh, of Seedlinked and, and really a, as a mission of, of really boosting agrobiodiversity with Seedlink by bringing an infrastructure that allow to make selection or breeding or trialing easier, decentralized and collaborative at lower cost. We, we really think bringing a tool that can help all crop, as you know, close to 75% of R&D on breeding is, is really on, on, on couple crops like corn and bean, but we really want to build and develop a breeding system or seed system that really uh, bring adapted variety of all crop um, and create a breeding ecosystem that is adaptive, not capital intensive, um, and connected, uh, where all the information is transparent and grower can really make sound decision on what to plant. Um, and so the foundation of Seedlinked uh, project is really that the farmer knowledge on seed is absolutely amazing and totally underestimated, um, and also that with this device that I'm just uh, giving this presentation, everybody's connected and now we have so much technology um, and, 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 and knowledge in, in, in data science and how to craft data and, and, and create insight uh, with this knowledge is absolutely amazing. And so why can't we connect every grower and breeder together to work together and create collective intelligence and and it really has come out to this dream of like, what if we connected seed knowledge of thousands, a hundred thousands of grower uh, together, what would be the power? Uh, and so from that, from here, I just want to, to dive into Seedlinked, uh, the basis and, and quickly switch. So to um, open the mobile app uh, and see what we can do. So for example, here um, we are on the track. Um, I have trials that are going to be ongoing. Um, I've been invited to a trial. Um, and I can see also we now we have notifications. So I can see, oh, I receive a notification from C2 Kitchen that I've been invited to a trial, for example. Here are the variety of a winter squash Maxima trial. I can see description. Uh, from who it is, I can decline or accept the trial and say I accept it. So trial automatically land in my dashboard here. And as soon as I plan, I can start reviewing here um, all the different traits. Um, if I want to uh, review storage and so forth, uh, I can do it right away. Um, it's a very easy uh, here. Oh, I receive a notification. Maybe I can click on it. Um, have you done storage evaluation for your squash, uh, for example? So also we have a feed that allow to communicate directly with a participant from the trial manager. Um, as you can see here, uh, we have internal notification or push notification. So you can see this is international notification. Um, and uh, what I showed you before is, is push notification. So that's really allowed to facilitate uh, communication on trialing. As uh, Stefan uh, with Seed Saver mentioned, with the growing number of participants, it's become 
more daunting task uh, to communicate with everyone, to notify, to send reminders. And so we built this new feature recently to really help on that. And then, so to come back to trial here, you can see uh, uh, how easy is it to really send review. You can even enter comment behind each review. Um, you have access to the community feed at any given time, so you can see all the posts have been posted or advice or comments and so forth. Um, and when you're done with the trial, well, maybe before we do that, you can also um, see description of each trial, like so the trial manager can give um, suggestion or target of the trial. You can also, um, you can add your own check now. So edit a check for each trial. You can add a variety that you want. For example, so you have many different little features that really help make the trialing very easy and, 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 and useful. And when you're done, um, you complete a trial, like I'm on my result time here, the results are instant and so are connected. We really believe that is essential. And so you can filter by trade, for example. So here I just want to see uh, disease for uh, or a flavor uh, or yields. Uh, and I can see the filter of the results automatically. I can select by zone. I can look at uh, the comment of, of everyone. Uh, and all the command by traits um, of each variety. Um, I can look at uh, image of the trial from everybody uh, that posted. Um, so there's really this sense of of truly being a two-way street where I'm participating in a trial, I send information, but I also get so much knowledge. Um, and so then all this information is all consolidated into the Explorer search that's going to become a marketplace uh, where, for example, I can look um, many different varieties. So if I want to look back at a broccoli um, and to see the top broccoli, let's say Green Magic, I can see all the pictures that have been posted, all the information. I can even see who is selling it. I can see the trade. I can go in comments. Um, and I can add to wishlist, for example, um, to my wishlist um, and, and really make informative decision with information of all. So if I go back into my wishlist, for example, I can see my broccoli. I'm maybe planning for my spring broccoli. Uh, if I click compare, I can quickly see how they stack in terms of different traits or disease. See Monty has a really excellent disease resistance uh, and I can uh, really look at it. From here, I can also create a direct trial for next year, my own trial. I can click contracts if I want. And here I create um, my own trial. Um, so I can add to planting or create a new planting, which will create uh, your own trial. Um, I'm going to exit here, but um, and go back. Um, so really with, with SeedLinked, we created a trial ecosystem where you can really be part, participate of trial uh, at all stage of breeding program. You can see all the results, it's all connected. You can have access to all the information and you can see also where um, the full story of all the seeds that connect all the data from now we have the platform has made more than 350 trials across 35 crop. So there's more than 100,000 of insight behind all those variety here. Um, and you can see which variety, which was a breeder of, of the variety, uh, who sell uh, and, and so forth. Um, All right, thank you, Nico. Uh, thanks everyone, thanks for having me and thanks Stefan and Lane for mentioning it too. And 
looking forward for the discussion. So let's see, I think we're working on Chris's video in the background. Maybe we could go ahead and show, um, show the video from Hawaii of Marielle and Glenn and Tyler. Does that work, Rebecca, or do you want to go with Chris's first? Let's go to Marielle and down to Hawaii. All right. All right. Aloha, peace builders, change makers, earth stewards, and seed planters. I am Tyler Levine, and I'm the founder of Seeds of Honua. I'm here today with Extension Agents Glenn Tevez and Marielle Hampton from the University of Hawaii's College of Tropical Agriculture and Human Resources. We hope to take you on a journey today that follows the story of seed selection and variety trials through a citizen science program from beginning to end. This program hosted by Seeds of Honua in partnership with UH CTAR really engaged a cohort of gardeners across the state of Hawaii who grew and selected individual tomato and pigeon pea plants best adapted to their specific growing conditions. We hope that the structure of this program and the lessons learned throughout can inspire and guide future citizen science initiatives focused on grower involvement in the plant breeding process. The inspiration for this project came from Dr. Jim Myers, vegetable breeder at Oregon State University. At the last OSA conference, we discussed citizen science and my knowledge of that label was new. But to a large extent, I was doing this with farmers for decades, conducting all kinds of trials in their fields. Jim and I have been developing new tomato varieties for a couple of years now, crossing Hawaii lines with his P20 lines. One of these crosses was a UH grape tomato, Komohana, crossed to one of Jim's recent varieties, Indigo Kiwi, a green wind ripe variety crossed to a P20 selection. I grew out the F1 and saved seed of the F2 for this project. The goal of this project was to provide an opportunity for gardeners to participate in the process of individual plant selection by exposing them to the processes used by seed breeders, as well as teaching them how to grow these crops. An added goal was, was instead of sending seeds back to us, to share their selections with friends and neighbors. A long-term vision was to train gardeners in trialing seeds, providing feedback, and saving seed from promising individuals. With Hawaii's varied climate, including rainfall ranges of zero to 500 inches annually, growing elevations from sea level to 6,000 feet, over 160 different soil types, and temperature ranges from 40 to 90 degrees Fahrenheit, this program had the potential to identify selections from many of our microclimates. The key components of this project include recruiting participants through outreach and networking efforts, distributing seed from selected varieties, supporting participants during the stages of plant growth with check-in meetings and resources, providing seed saving and sharing education to encourage seed distribution in the community, and soliciting participant feedback about their experience to improve future projects. We will now take a few minutes to review our process and share insights, challenges, as well as the many successes that we have encountered with our team's very first citizen science seed project. So to begin, we will look at recruitment. To recruit participants, we used a Google form with questions about registrants' climatic conditions, previous garden experience, and expectations for the citizen science program. The, the form was sent out through email lists and social media channels for gardening and seed-related groups, including Master Gardeners, the Hawaii Seed Growers Network, and School Garden Networks. In less than a month, about 80 people from around the state of Hawaii had signed up. By our first cohort meeting though, um, only 50% of those people attended and at the last meeting uh, of the cohort, 
six months later, approximately 25% of the people that initially signed up made it through the entire program. To ensure we weren't sending seeds to individuals without a way to follow up, we made the first meeting mandatory for participants that wanted to receive seed. Following signups, we mailed out the seeds and emailed participants a resource about unique considerations for planting a seed garden rather than food or ornamental gardens. Once everyone received their seed, we began a series of online meetings to check in and guide participants through the growing process. Our team knew we needed to help our participants be successful so they would continue practicing what they learned. We did our best to provide tailored support with a quick turnaround time for questions and issues. We held monthly Zoom meetings to hear participant updates and respond to requests for help and shared helpful resources like extension bulletins and fact sheets about growing the plants in Hawaii, making plant selections, and other topics that we reviewed during our meetings. We had an agenda for each meeting and enough team members to facilitate the discussion, manage the Zoom room, and answer questions as they came up. We also asked participants to use a website called Padlet to post photos of their plants each month, which was a fun way to see everyone's progress at a glance. While some of our participants were experienced gardeners, others needed help with the basics, like germinating seeds and managing pests. Our monthly meetings were a good opportunity to check in with the group and look for patterns in participant needs. If questions came up during the meeting, a facilitator would take notes and add the questions and answers to our running Q&A document. Participants were also encouraged to add their questions to the document before each meeting, so we had a chance to review what we should cover during the session. We usually asked attendees to use the Zoom chat function to ask questions, which helped quieter participants to weigh in and prevented chatty people from monopolizing the conversation. Once most of the tomato plants were fruiting, we also invited participants to join us in a live tomato seed saving demonstration to see and practice wet seed processing. For our next project, we plan to record our monthly meetings so people can revisit the content or view the session if they were absent. Growers learned how to connect with the ecosystem of their garden and select qualities and traits beneficial for the plant's growth, appeal, and taste. The natural next step was to save seeds from selected plants. The original plan was to have participants send some of their saved seed back to Glen, along with the description of expressed traits. Instead of taking this route, we decided to put the ownership of seed back into the hands of gardeners that grew them. This was a very powerful movement towards seed sovereignty. Uh, participants were encouraged to plant a percentage of their saved seeds to continue the process of selection and eventually create their very own locally adapted tomato or pigeon pea variety. The rest of the seed was shared as gifts or donations to friends, family, neighbors, um, local schools or organizations, as well as other community outlets. For our project evaluation, we were really interested in learning if participants found the format useful and which elements were the most helpful as they went through the process of growing out their plants and making selections. We conducted a simple post survey during our last meeting with about a 75% response rate for the active participants. 86% of respondents said they will save more seeds as a result of the project, and 66% plan to show or teach others more about seed saving. We asked about each element of the online format and found that the breakout rooms were often perceived as less helpful than other activities like the live demonstration and Padlet. Feedback from the comments showed us that the virtual platform was effective and enjoyable especially for those in remote communities in Hawaii. Folks were grateful to be part of the project and eager for more opportunities to practice their skills and gather online. This project was a huge learning experience for our team, but several lessons stood out. Since the process was so new, we needed to be flexible in responding to unexpected challenges as they came up. 
For example, developing a Q&A system when basic gardening questions dominated our first check-in meeting. Our team could usually provide responses to participant questions within a few days, which can make a big difference to beginners by improving their chances of success. We also found that using online tools was crucial. Zoom breakout rooms and chat helped manage different personalities to make sure everyone had a chance to chime in. And the Padlet website created visual displays that kept participants engaged and excited about the project while providing a snapshot of the group's progress at a glance. We also lost about 75% of the initial signups over the course of the project. So we made our first meeting mandatory to avoid sending seeds to individuals that never participated further. Lastly, don't forget that if you're working with individuals in very different environments, they'll have very different challenges and needs to have a successful experience. This program celebrates the special relationship between seeds and people, inviting our communities to connect with each other and their environment through planting, saving, and sharing seeds. We hope to continue creating opportunities to share the practice of seed saving with our Hawaii community and beyond. Speaking of seeds, thank you for the opportunity to share our first citizen science project um, and we look forward to answering any questions you may have about our experience. Awesome, guys. That was wonderful. Thank you. Hi, my name is Chris Smith. I'm the executive director of a small nonprofit in Western North Carolina called the Utopian Sea Project. We do a whole bunch of different crop trials. Today, I'm going to speak to you about a community seed selection project that we took on in 2021. It's actually the first time we've done something like this. We're a fairly young nonprofit, uh, but basically we were trying to select uh, okra variety back towards pale genetics. So this pod in the top left is a good pale pod and the same population of seeds has all these darker green colors and we were trying to get it back to all pale. It's actually a project that came out of a restoration project that I was working on with Seed Savers Exchange. They, they sent me the seeds for Whidbey White and told me that there was some mixed up green genetics and we were trying to select it back to this pale pod so it's been this multi-year selection process to get back to something that's truly pale. And I was doing fairly small populations in 2018 and 2019. And in 2020, I had the opportunity to do a much longer, you know, 250 foot row of this okra. And I was able to make some very harsh selections on the population. And I felt pretty good about where it was going. But the seeds I had from that year, you know, I had, I had about 10 pounds of seeds even after the harsh selection. And I was never going to be able to grow all those out myself. And obviously, when you're making selections year on year, then the previous year's seeds become somewhat redundant. So I had all these seeds and I was like, well, I could I could make this project be much broader than myself and have a whole bunch of other people grow them out, basically, and uh, make selections with me. And that was kind of like the somewhat organic birth of this community seed selection project was just to engage with a lot more people. So I wanted community engagement from this project, and I also wanted to advance my own selection goals with a broader group of people. Uh, so that, that's what I wanted to do. Uh, in March of 2021, I created a web page and put it out there that I had this these free seeds to distribute for people that wanted to participate in this project. The first of the first challenge that came up, uh, and I wouldn't say this would happen for everybody doing a community seed selection project, but that web page got picked up by a freebie website, which then got picked up by every other freebie website uh, in the world. And I ended up, you know, having over 8,000 people subscribe to this project and still climbing rapidly by the time I closed down the sign up form. Uh, it was pretty frustrating, to be honest, because I wanted to. I was trying to get a very targeted group of people that were maybe already seed savers, at least already gardeners, uh, but people that were truly engaged and interested in doing this project with me. And I ended up getting just thousands and thousands of people that were just like, woo, free seeds or actually free anything. It, it didn't matter. Um, so it took me quite a bit of time to go through that sign up form and try and pull out the people that I, I thought were genuine. And 
I'm sure I missed some people that were genuine that didn't get seeds. And I'm sure I sent seeds to some people that seemed genuine, but weren't. So that, that was a challenge early on. <laughs> like I say, not likely to be repeated, but I did change the way I did my second project. We went straight into a colored one, which is still currently active. Because uh, the other thing I came across, even with my 250 seed packets that I sent out, I, I should say that So True Seeds sponsored this project, which gave me the funds to um, service 250 people and to, you know, shipping uh, costs and packaging and all that kind of stuff. But even with just 250 packets, uh, as a small single employee nonprofit, that felt like a lot to handle as sending out all those seeds. And it reminded me that I didn't want to be a seed company and I didn't want to deal with all this shipping and distribution. So once we did the colored one, which launched on the back of the okra one, I actually reached out to Southern Exposure Seed Exchange and Working Food in Florida got on board and I asked if they would uh, you know, sell and distribute the seeds for me. And then I would run the community seed selection part of it. And it worked out to be a, an awesome partnership. I was able to send two pounds of a, a collard seed to Southern Exposure. They have the, you know, seed packing machine and resources and infrastructure to get them packed and distributed. And because we were selling them on the website, it avoided the free thing. People buying a $5 packet of seeds are probably truly engaged and we were be able we were able to run it as a bit of a fundraiser for the Utopian Seed Project. So 50% of the sales come back to support my project. So it, it became a much more win-win-win than the first attempt where I felt overwhelmed and burdened by selling, sending out these packets. Um, so that was definitely a big learning curve. But once I did get those 250 packets out to people, you can see they're spread all over the country uh, with a concentration, not surprisingly, in the Southeast with this being okra. Um, then we got into the community engagement side of this project, which is where things really shone, in my opinion. Uh, I was putting out a, about a monthly video that was kind of being filmed in real time to kind of be a educational resource to go along with this. I've, I've participated in participatory breeding projects before, and I can, I've kind of received the seeds and then never heard from the people again. And even at the end, when I've tried to follow up and say, so where do you want me to send these seeds? Then I don't even get a response by email. And I'm not saying I'm the perfect person at responding to emails. Apologies if I've ignored your email. But what I did try and do throughout this project was to stay in touch with people. We had a, a newsletter. We had this YouTube uh, playlist where we put out these real-time educational resources. And we also had a Facebook group and the Facebook group, while not everyone's on Facebook, did give the opportunity for members of the project to connect with each other. So it wasn't always coming directly through me. And that was nice because I, I saw some posts around like people were like, oh, you're also in Alabama. Where about it? Where about are you? Maybe we can talk or share um, ideas or combat challenges. So the fact that there started being like, into community connections was really exciting to me as well. So the group has been really fun. People were able to share photographs, ask questions, support each other. And I really feel, feel like there was good learning throughout this process. Um, we had an Instagram hashtag and, and more photo sharing. Um, so it, it kind of continued to be inspiring throughout the entire process, not just kind of like a you know, semi seeds at the end and we're done sort of process. Um, it does. So, so the community engagement aspect, fantastic, really excited about all of that. Um, the people I've worked with have been awesome. I've actually had uh, 58 packets of seed returned to me uh, and more promised. And alongside that, I asked people to fill in an air table form with their selected pod and some information about the project. And, and this is where things get a little bit like, I'm unsure about the benefit of this project in terms of the seed selection. The community engagement mission, fantastic, awesome. I would do this again just for that. Have I actually advanced my breeding goals? I obviously won't fully know until next year, but one thing that became apparent to me fairly quickly was when you have a specific criteria that you're selecting for, in this case, a pale pod, 
then really you should try and keep all the other variables constant and just select for that one trait. By sending seeds, 250 packets of seeds out all over the country to all these different people in all these different places, then we kind of went in the opposite direction and we had different sized plants, we have different sized leaves, we have different pod colors, and these all came from a population of plants that were pretty uniform by the time I selected them in that third year. I was getting three to four feet height plants. They were all looking fairly similar. Um, and I rogued out all the off types so that the seeds saved were just from these palest pods. And yet when I started seeing pictures coming in, there was a whole range of different phenotypes being expressed. And I don't know if it was genetic expression um, or environmental. And then if it's environmental, how do we make those selections in a way that will further this breeding goal. So I'm going to plant them all out next year and see what happens. It'll be, I, I'm never going to go backwards because it's so easy to rogue out with okra with it being self-pollinating, but it does leave me with that open question. And then to finish, we're currently in the collard project. It's slightly different, this one. This one is a whole bunch of different um, varieties that were intercrossed. And so it's a much more diverse set of seeds and really we've sent them out with kind of an open question it's like what can this diverse collection of collard seeds become and we're really encouraging communities to select within their region for their own selection criteria while still providing the educational resources i'm happy to answer questions but thanks for listening Awesome. More exciting work. Beautiful. Um, all right. I think unless I'm forgetting someone, we've got through our videos and I believe we've got Kristen up now from Second Generation Seeds and Seed Stewards. Yeah. Thank you, Jay. And thank you, everyone. And uh, Jay in particular, just thanks for you know, honestly doing a lot of work to make it possible for me to participate, to be very accommodating. Um, so my name's Kristen. I'm from a collective called Second Generation Seeds that works with growers from across the Asian diaspora. Um, and so here, I'll just go into this slideshow. Um, you know, I had come from, uh, for maybe seven or eight years, I had been doing the field trials for Kitazawa Seed Company which until it was just sold this past year was like the oldest, uh, you know, purveyor of Asian crop varieties in the US. Um, and so I would mostly be evaluating their different varieties to kind of supplement their catalog uh, and then started doing some commercial seed production for them as well. Um, and a lot of what we're gonna talk about in this presentation is actually kind of counter to a lot of the things that I learned how to do trials, um, where we're, we kind of needed to get rid of like the myth and notion of like a scientific objectivity. And we really wanted to delve into, in fact, like the richness of that subjectivity, the richness of all the cultural fabrics that kind of are interwoven with these different plants evolutions. Uh, and so for me, a lot of what I realized through doing trials was, you know, when I really listened to the plants that I loved the most and the plants that contributed to this sort of fantastic life that I got to live. Uh, what they were encouraging me towards was just recognizing how their presence in my life allowed me to find and identify all these different communities and in us finding one another, uh, how can we then continually build in a sustainable way with each other. Uh, and so that got kind of really put into motion, uh, you know, in spring of 2020. So I I'm mostly a fresh market producer um, and like most small diversified farms as the pandemic started, uh, I had to look at doing a sort of small CSA distribution as part of my business, just with other market channels being severely impacted by COVID. Um, and as a seed grower, you know, with enough of my production really devoted to seed trials, uh, commercial seed production, you know, I wasn't in a really great position to do a super robust vegetable box program. And so for me, the challenge was thinking of like, what are the needs of my community that are most pressing right now? What's being really uh, 
what's really emergent in terms of what this pandemic is highlighting and in the ways that my community is being impacted and has historically been impacted. Um, and how can I best be of service? And so uh, to supplement the boxes that we could do and just the challenges that especially families in our community were facing, we thought we could just do a little bit more work on the front end and build curriculum and actually realize that a CSA box distribution is a really great, uh, you know, it's a really great program to have as part of a breeding and trials pipeline, essentially. And so we created a shared database for all of our members and also tried to work collaboratively uh, and in our second year ended up becoming collectively organized uh, so that one, we reduce the burden for fresh market farmers in doing these CSAs, trying to hopefully remove some duplicative tasks of every farmer writing like a really funny and clever and insightful newsletter, having tons of recipes to offer their members and giving all of our respective members like ways to communicate uh, with each other. And so what we really wanted to do was find a way that everybody, whether you were a farmer, you know, or just a community member, someone getting a CSA box, a chef, community organizer, that everybody realized that they were in fact a stakeholder in our seed system, regardless of scale, regardless of background, regardless of scientific training or any sort of academic education. Uh, so we wanted to create this really totally decentralized way of doing things where all of that information existed on this horizontal plane. None of the information was being gatekept necessarily and all the decisions were kind of like part of these really robust conversations. Um, and so, you know, when we're describing this to another friend at a different seed company, they said like, you know, this isn't a good idea. You're basically giving people too many exits off the freeway. Like this is gonna go in so many different directions. But I think for so many communities, you know, that have been often clustered as a monolith of Asian American and seen as one things. And for a lot of our crops to similarly been exposed to this kind of like hegemonic view, like the notorious catalog section that's just called ambiguously Asian greens, you know, we really wanted to focus on the pathways that have been divergent and really shed light, um, you know, on the real kind of distinct cultural perspectives that informed you know, our shared evolution as like human and plant communities. So we try to encourage, you know, just these different ways that people could interact with each other. So that in a box, if something was unfamiliar to one family, it was really kind of supported by this robust amount of information supplied by everybody else. Um, so if something was challenging, like learning how to use different types of squash leaves, because that was one of our criteria for a Korean style summer squash project was like, oh, the leaves have to be like of a really good edible quality. So it was like, how can we best actually have people prepare lots of different, you know, different preparations to acknowledge, uh, you know, distinctions and traits that, and find where everything has value, everything and everyone's perspective has value. And so what we realized was that really a lot of this was just uh, more acts of translation than anything else, right? And so for me, you know, English is my first language and somewhat regrettably for probably any humans I have to interact with, science is essentially my most refined love language. And so we mostly wanted to have these exchanges where we could share these different forms of knowledge, um, you know, in this meaningful way. So. The next few slides are just presentations and materials that we put out through our Seed Stewards program, which was run by six farmers and engaged other farmers across the country, uh, some internationally, mostly in Japan, Korea, and Palestine, and then uh, all our respective communities. So the title of this presentation, when in July we focused on different forms of perilla, you know, was based on this idea that I heard a lot in my community uh, from my generation of folks saying, you know, oh, I've gotten slapped for bringing my grandma shiso. And is, are we just making this up? Is this just like a, you know, Korean Japanese tension or is there something to this? So they're like, great, that's a great story. Let's actually use this as a springboard to talk about subspecies specificity in the Perilla genome, where in the West, Perilla is classified uniformly as a single species genus. But when we look in East Asia, there's a more kind of nuanced breakdown of all the different essential oils and perilla is classified into no fewer than six kind of really distinct uh, genetic chemotypes. 
So we could hand in hand in our kind of monthly virtual potlucks, do a presentation where we show some of this research that maybe isn't always making its way to us in the US, but then translate it, translate it for families, translate it for kids. So instead of showing them this sequence of genes, we created coloring books across all these different crops to kind of say, actually, you know, it's not just a matter of language, calling something shiso, calling something tiato is actually like in those, uh, you know, our ancestral tongues a lot more precise than Western taxonomy. So how do we just sort of work from these places of fostering what our communities already know and just giving it multiple forms of expression? And we're not above bribery, so we would make a lot of games and challenges just to get especially our young people really invested and engaged in this. And so another slide from our presentation, again, it's just trying to find these ways. For me, I love being a nerd and I love really this deep dive into horticulture. And so when we talk about domestication processes, when we talk about all the different things that our ancestors decided were beautiful and delicious and utilitarian, you know, what are the ways that we can understand like the value of how we've all become distinct. And so we can start to see like in terms like polyploidy, what we're really just talking about actually is, you know, these repeated acts of observation, agreeing to take care of someone and a sort of joint accountability. And that's what we just really want to build upon is that legacy of accountability. Um, so a big part of our program is asking all members to conduct community interviews for all of these different crops. So to find somebody who can contextualize these plants. Like for us, context is like the foundation of everything we're doing. And we think it's kind of like convenient, but it's all these C words, right? It's like climate, cuisine, culture, and context. All of those things have to be in place and have to be restored, you know, just on a sort of spiritual level for us uh, to think about moving forward. And so, you have kids being able to just talk to their aunts and their grandmas or their friends' grandmas, getting these recipes, providing this longer kind of multifaceted story uh, to kind of just share. And so it's not saying like, you know, for me as a Korean, the way I know how to prepare perilla is really based in, you know, the Korean form of it. And for our Vietnamese families, they have really particular things they do with their variety of perilla. And when you have it prepared in these respective ways, you understand like why each of these varieties has their merit. So we're not looking for a one ring to rule them all sort of mentality. Uh, and I'd say, you know, ultimately the thing that we really hope that all of this work does, even if it's wiggy from a somewhat scientific perspective, is, you know, restoring a sense for our communities that, you know, culture, is equally rooted in imagination as it is in memory and culture isn't just the things that we get to carry forward from our ancestors and feel precious and rigid about it but something that we can actually have permission to leave our own imprint on um, and so for us we're looking to merge this program with a breeding collaboration with uh, uc davis to start looking at uh, asian crops for organic systems so I want to make sure I leave enough time for Q and A. Thank you so much. Um, you guys are all super inspiring um, and making my heart glow right now. Um, we are technically supposed to end at four thirty, but I have um, word that this Zoom channel is wide open, so. Um, we we can we can keep going um, past 4:30, but if anybody needs to leave, um, feel free, and we won't we won't scorn you for that. Um, but yeah, we've got we've got time now, so I don't know anybody. Do any of you presenters uh, panelists have any questions or or responses to anybody else that you saw anything that really stuck out to you that um, yeah, either, you know, a question about a, a platform or are you going to do coloring books and bingo in your next project? Um, yeah, I just thought we'd start seeing if panelists had any anything for one another. And then um, after that, we can just open it up to questions from anybody. Tyler. 
I, I just want to first acknowledge the incredible array of diversity we have in this room of passion, of expertise, of knowledge, of wisdom, and of heart. Uh, I think that that was perpetual throughout this entire program. And Jay, I want to thank you also for putting this together, because I think that we've really seen this intrinsic web of connection tying together um, the beginning, you know, the seed, beginning it all, like we have our... Um, seed trials, plant trials, and we have taste trials, and then like bring it, bridging together our community, bridging together culture, and these different ways uh, of being, and these different forms of knowledge, I think is, is what brings so much value to this process of democratizing crop variety trials, um, because you know, it's not just academic or scientific knowledge, it's this indigenous wisdom that we're bringing to the table. And, and that's really important. It's also the wisdom, uh, the intuitive wisdom within ourselves as beings, um, as a part of this complex web. So I guess the, it's more of a comment that I wanna make here. And it's, um, you know, how can we continue to bridge these projects together so we are, um, uniting, like, I feel like we, we've seen the power that these localized and regionalized programs have on their communities and how can we, uh, I guess, come together and maybe in a cohort of some sort and, uh, to both, you know, plant our roots within community action and share uh, the fruits and seeds of this beyond just our localized community. And I think, you know, it, it, the first step was this incredible presentation and program right here. And how can we continue to network, coordinate and, and grow as a, as a uh, I guess, community of um, democratizing crop variety trials and so on. So I just wanted to like put that out there. That's something I was thinking about. Because we have the entire spectrum from, um, you know, tasting and I don't know. Sorry. It's like the entire life cycle. Yeah, I think um, I loved getting you all um, you all together. And I don't think I, it had even occurred to me, like you're saying, yeah, that there are all these sort of different parts and stages um, that, that came together on this panel. And I don't know if anybody has any, you know, ideas of ways to stay in touch. I mean, I think, I think everybody to different extents is like active on social media. Um, seed Stewards has a mighty network. So like there's organic seed commons and not, it's not on organic seed commons, but on the kind of same platform um, could be another, um, another way. Um, Anybody got any other ideas? Rue. Um, so I, I've only been really engaging on organic seed commons more recently, but um, I, I could imagine a synergy space uh, on organic seed commons for participatory work. And I just wanna say how incredible and inspiring all of this work is um, and that part of what I would I would love to have more connection with these more ground root these grassroots um, networks um, because as someone who's working from within the university a lot of what I really want to do feels so fringe in my day-to-day -day interactions and to me, I'm like, this is not French. This is this is putting power back in people's hands so that they know that feeding themselves and having relationships with seeds is their heritage as humans. And um, I, I'm just so inspired and I would really appreciate staying connected.
Yeah, we can definitely work on starting a, uh, a synergy space on organic seed commons um, to keep folks um, folks connected. Nico. Yeah, uh, just want to again thank you, Jay and Rue, for your comment and Tyler too. And and I try, you know, to build <laughs> a tool to try to connect people. Also realizing that. It's just a tool and it, it, you know it's great to connect people and but ultimately all this technology it's a tool but it never replace in person getting together uh in person together and share and and it's, i love all the synergy space <laughs> it's a little contradictory as i i'm trying to build a space for that but at the end is yeah it never replace getting together so but thanks again, everyone. Chris Smith um, is just telling me he has to take off at 4.30. Does anybody have a, a question for Chris? We can catch him before he has to go. All right. Thanks, Chris. Looking forward to growing the collards. Yeah, I've got one quick comment, if I may, before I jump off. Yes. Um, I, it's funny that Rue commented that she, uh, they were wanting to connect with grassroots organizations because I've been speaking to my board and wanting to do a better job of connecting with university organizations. So there's definitely, I think, things that we could benefit from by being better connected with the university system that from the outside looking in often seems to have have, have a lot of a lot of, it, a lot of it together in a way that I feel I could learn from that um, and I don't want to replicate what universities are doing but I think there's definitely a lot of synergy there so I'm personally open to those those collaborations uh, so I just want to throw that out there it's, it's a two-way it's a two-way thing great yeah, and it was it was fun hearing Kristen talking about starting to work with uh, with UC Davis and you know Tyler working with Extension at the University of of Hawaii. It it seems like there's progress being made. You just got to find the right the right people at the uh, at the institutions and and then I think yeah, just this matchmaking kind of thing because if there's people within the institutions and they can't find the right people to interact with, then that's not going to go anywhere either. Okay, we got some hands up over here. Do you have a? Uh, I'll just hey. say real quick. Um, yeah. Hey, um, so I'm working with the Kenobi Project now in Canada, and um, so it's a partnership between UBC and the Bata Initiative for Canadian Seed Security, which is an um, you know, involves like five different regions with their own like groups that work directly with farmers, um, like a well, series on here from Farm Folk, which is a BC organization. Um, I'm just gonna say out loud, I love the, just the volume and diversity of ideas. Um, it was, it's been really great to listen to. And like, um, we've been talking about implementing like a monthly, like farm club or like online meeting. And it's really cool to hear that that worked well in Hawaii. Um, and I love the idea of offering to make that a potluck and we'll see what people come up with or at least a couple times during the season. Um, yeah, because I feel like like each one of us has like really different strengths of our programs and and, I, and yeah, lots of ways to learn from each other. But that seems to be a theme that's coalescing, but really appreciate all the ideas. Thank you. It looked like Siri Siri had a question in the in the chat um, asking folks where do you look to find histories of seed varieties? Who do you ask? Do you know of any um, good resources? Anybody want to address that? There's
I mean, I think a lot of us could probably refer you to some academic resources, um, but I feel like what was coming out, you know, for me with with Kristen's especially is you know, just looking, finding the people who that's part of their their cultural cultural heritage, and so they know how to use those plants already, and that's where you're going to find the most, you know, relevant information. Yeah, and and I, I will say um, uh, at, at Seed Savers, Seed Savers is a good resource for that kind of information too. Um, part of our mission is not just preserving the varieties in our collection, but also um, documenting their seed histories. And um, so we have in house we have a full time seed historian and a couple assistant seed historians, and they work really hard to. Um, just accurately and thoroughly document the histories of these varieties. So yeah, feel free to reach out to, to me or anybody at Seed Savers and we can try to help you uncover some of that information. I'll say yeah, Jay, just, a, oh, go ahead, Glenn. Okay, yeah, um, yeah, I mean, I, funny you mentioned Seed Savers because um, Kent Wheelie used to come to our island once a year and I would spend a day with him and. Uh, he was a walking encyclopedia, so I'd ask him, you know, where, where did black plum come, come from and where did this come from? And then he would tell me, oh, yeah, the black tomatoes really love the heat. And so, yeah, I found out and planted it, and one of them just took over the whole field. So, yeah, the, the black tomatoes love heat. Um, you have to just go out there and ask people. You're going to have to talk to them. I mean, some of these farmers that develop varieties, um, that's how I found out a lot of them about where these, these varieties came from. Um, but we're losing the information real fast. Yeah, I was going to just say also to Seed Savers Exchange Credit, like they've reached out to us. We have a partnership with them now where we've been looking at a lot of their accessions that originated in Asia, but had a sort of dubious slash murky kind of story and narrative about how they ended up here or who's telling that story. And just to say to Siri too, like I think part of the problem is that those histories are pretty deliberately uh, opaque, right? Like I think there is like a lot of obscuring of that information, uh, either actively or just by the fact that the history can be so layered depending on the point of view uh, that you're viewing it. And I know just for me as a Korean American, just because of the long relationship with Japanese occupation and then this sort of new form of American occupation, you know, there's really hard challenges that block a sense of just like having a, a very intact way of telling a story. Um, so I think, again, just to come back to this point that we really need like multitudes of, of ways of expressing knowledge and ways of acknowledging wisdom to kind of piece together these stories, because they often have conflicting viewpoints, but that's all part and parcel, like all of us our stories aren't just neat packages, you know, but that messiness is also really uh, uh, telling to the journey. Nico, if, if folks are interested to design their own trials and use seed linked as a as a platform what's the process for them to follow just contact you all or okay yeah please contact me and i can uh, drop my email uh, here in the chat um, i would love to to collaborate with all of you and learn and and make this tool which is, you know, as you see, we are also diverse here and how to make a tool, a unique tool, like embrace all this diversity is probably the biggest challenge, but uh, it's really important. And so I, I would love to work with all of you and get your feedback and make this tool more accessible for different uh, community and diverse viewpoint. Uh, so. And Stefan, in, in your presentation, you mentioned that you would send out like three three kind of entries from each trial to each grower. Is that like part of that kind of triad triadic design? And is that what you guys are using or set up to use in Seedlinked? 
Yes, that's correct. Okay. Yeah, so we C-linked, um, we, I mean, Jacob Van Etten was really one of our main advisor and inspiration about C-linked, about this triadic and sim simplicity in the bottom up approach for the farmer and how, how to simplify this. And so C-linked is connected to the R package, uh, packet loose ranking from Jacob. Um, and so you can create a trial with, like Stefan mentioned, 10, 20 variety. Here. We did the colored couple of years ago already, and everybody received a random combination of three. Um, now, uh, starting this year, and thanks to Jacob making the R package evolving, we can make any combination. So it can be three, four, five, six out of any number. Um, and I put it a couple of, yeah. Go ahead. I just put a couple of predictions from Jacob. Pretty re it's amazing what Jacob do, do it at, is doing at Biodiversity. It's really worth reading. Kristen, have you guys used that sort of approach at all in any of your work or like that sort of triadic ap approach or, or is that getting a little more academic or in, and statistical than is needed in your approach right now? No, no, we've definitely done, yeah, kind of more standard things like that of replicated trials and having kind of like a pen and chick sort of field plots um because again like it's that culture is just one of the legs of our sort of community seed table so to speak um so a lot of it still revolves around kind of like assessing climatic conditions and looking for a, adaptation and improvement possibilities uh so we do i mean but in some ways we'll do a triad but ask to kind of like have a unifying factor of like preparing it the way that you love to prepare like a cucumber dish or a winter squash dish to kind of just narrow down and again, kind of just build our capacity to like draw these connections between some of our preferences with equating that with a section, like a selection index, so to speak. And there was a great question from Solveig about minimum participant with triadic. Um, this is many recommendation in publication and let, don't let, uh, let's not get um, scared about, okay, I need 200 grower to, to trial 12 variety. Um, really at any size we've seen with, with Julie and Ruth's groups into kitchen, even with 10 grower and uh, really the, the basic is to make it simple. It doesn't, it's not to be academic or it, it's to simplify the process and and the trend of data is just amazing anyway. To, to me, that's, sorry, I hope I'm not jumping the- No, go ahead, Rue. Okay. <laughs> to me, that's so encouraging when you think about the diversity of participants. And then also when you think about the diversity of, um, of assessments that you might be asking to make, like for example, if you're asking people to taste um, and give feedback on taste, um, I work with potatoes. How many ways can you cook a potato? A lot of different ways. And when we do our trials um, with our, our, our own late lab group, um, we roast the potatoes and they don't have salt and they don't like, they don't have anything on them. And um, so that's like, that's one way of assessing taste, but Often I'm, I'm doing this and I'm like, I just want people to like, I just want to send everyone a bag of potatoes and have them, you know, do what they want to do with them and then come back and say, well, this, this was fantastic. And so I, I think that is so encouraging to open up more possibilities for, um, for really getting down to how do people use these foods and these, these plants and, you know, what do they love about them? we can actually start to like share that information with like with smaller numbers. Um, Jay, yeah, you know, when we first started this project, I mean, I heard we had 60 people signed up and I started to freak out. I said, we got to cut it down. We got to do something. So we called a mandatory meeting seven days later and we ended up with 39 people. 
then I found out it wasn't 59. It was 80 people that signed up, you know, and, and so trying to figure out how we're going to manage all these guys. We didn't have them, you know, the whole thing down yet. You know, this was a total experiment from day one. Um, and, and I knew about the diversity of Hawaii, you know, I mean, 160 soil types, most of the climate, climatic zones, except tundra. So we have all these variables and it was coming out in the meetings. You know, somebody said, why are you guys running tomatoes right now? It's raining cats and dogs. And then another person says, it hasn't rained in six months over here. What are you talking about? So you have this, this wide range of stuff. And even in the selection process, you know, I had to get them to understand what are you really selecting for? It says, oh, I, like, I really like this tomato because it's soft and it's juicy and everything. And to me, I don't want a soft tomato because the insects are going to wipe it out. You know, so I'm trying to get them to understand all these different kind of things. And some of them really picked up. You could tell on their responses, they like, they had it down. I mean, they understand softness and color and sweetness and shape and everything like that. And it started to come out. And I know we have people who want to just jump in. Right now. And, and so we need to really look at what are we trying to accomplish? Because, I mean, you can accomplish a lot of things, some things you never, never even planned for. Uh, but what are you trying to accomplish in all this kind of thing? Um, but for us, it's food security. It's getting people's, uh, people are involved, getting their neighbors involved and their cousins involved. And that's why I think we changed along the way. Like, okay, take your seeds, give them to your neighbor. I mean, Nancy came up with the best idea. Give it away for Christmas presents. You know, this is my variety that I developed. Um, and, and so, yeah, I mean, it, it was a, learning experience but it was it was a lot of fun for me it was a lot of fun i mean i enjoyed every meeting we had that's great stefan when when you guys are are kind of using the feedback that you're getting from folks to decide what to then offer how many kind of criteria are you trying to to weigh that you're getting feedback from on people and is it just kind of an overall like rank these or is it you're trying to parse apart like, okay, for disease, for taste, you know, all these different criteria. Yeah, so um, it's kind of customized for each crop type and each trial that we do. Um, there, there maybe half a dozen different traits that we ask people to rate on a scale of one to five. Um, and some of, the, some of the consistent ones between crop types and trials are yield, um, flavor, earliness, um, disease resistance, um, appearance. Um, yeah, and I think the ones that we use the most are probably productivity and flavor. Um, but we, we try to make it simple for people. So we, we limit the number of traits to, to just a handful. I also wanted to say uh, just I had another comment in the spirit of collaboration, and that is I did talk a lot about how this community science program, um, one of the main goals is for us to identify outstanding varieties from our collection to introduce through our catalog. But I do want to emphasize that our collection is open source, open access. It doesn't belong to us. It's meant to be a resource for everybody else. So uh, we have worked, you know, like Kristen said, we've worked with, with um, her and we've worked with Rue and with Nico and we've, um, we've given varieties from the collection to them to trial. And, and that's, that's part of our mission is to, to share these varieties with as many people as possible and to make them available so that other people can trial them. So this is not just a, program this adapt program is not just something we use internally for you know to sell seeds through our catalog i just really wanted to to to, to mention that it's it's a resource for everybody and we hope that other people can utilize it great well everybody anybody got any um other more questions or parting parting thoughts 
I can just say one final thing here. Just one, right. one final thing. Uh, I think that what we're seeing here is really the union between the formal and informal branches of our seed system. And I think this is something that we need to focus on and to continue to kind of bridge because that is how we're going to perpetuate the living legacy of seeds that are uh, you know, slowly losing their stories within the memories of our older generations and then uh, within, you know, new seed varieties that we are um, growing out and, and breeding. Um, I'll just say, I'll just say a couple of things. It's been really interesting to just hear everybody's perspectives, really inspiring, but also um, really great to hear everybody's like lessons learned and I think some of the patterns I'm seeing here are definitely that getting committed and knowledgeable participants is one of the main barriers to this. Um, but then again, as Glenn mentioned, figuring out, well, maybe making progress on our breeding goals is not going to be where we're going to have um, the most difference um, as a result of these projects. Maybe we see that the power here is really that educational and community engagement component or even like Kristen's incredible work about gathering stories from people and um the you know a transformational power that we can get from that um in these kinds of projects so I know I personally came to this saying oh isn't this a great tool that we can evaluate all these varieties use like bring those f2 seeds out there see what we've got and I had to kind of let go of some of my ideas about saying we're going to get, you know, uh, major progress on these things and say, you know what, let's just enjoy this for what it is and see maybe a few of these people are going to end up being really into this and really gifted with it and we can move forward with those folks. Um, but then there's also just a lot of opportunities to bring other people, like Tyler said, into this awesome community of seed saving and get them excited and engaged. Um, and so I, I just want to thank everybody for being here and sharing all of your knowledge. Um, and I hope that I have opportunities to work on more projects like this so I can reach out to each of you and see if we can share some of these resources that you all have been talking about, which has been incredible. I think that was a, uh, a a great a great wrap up and summary and yeah I think that we can you know hit a lot of these different targets at the same time and and yeah on some projects be more focused like you're saying keep going with some of the most serious people and and do the more focused work but you're getting you know you're fulfilling all these other goals on the way um I will do my best to work on like setting up a synergy space that I think you'll just be able to find on organic seed commons. We could also like post it on kind of like the comments of like this particular event, right? We can do that pretty easily. Um, and um, I'll just put my email in here real quickly. If anybody's got any questions or anything that came up, um, resources um, that were shared that you didn't get, feel free to reach out to me. Um, and yeah, thank you for all of the presenters for sharing your inspiring work. And thank you guys all for hanging around and have a great rest of your day out in Hawaii evening other places um and enjoy uh blasting out of zoom back into the real world thank you guys so much <laughs>